Well, welcome everyone. We're um, really glad to have you today and we're very excited to bring um, this webinar to you from uh, our friends at State Street Associates. And uh, in a second, Megan will give you, um, or I'm sorry, Hannah will introduce Megan and, and give you a little bio. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm, I've been with the Institute since or I'm sorry, I've been with the Society since November, so I'm Shannon Schaff. I'm the Executive Director, and um, if you knew Mark Salter, I, uh, he retired and I took his place. I'm also very happy to be here. I also have my slide in advance. I also want to just take a minute to thank all of our annual sponsors. Our annual sponsors are our partners that help us bring um, programming like this to our membership. We will be recording today's um, webinar, and we will also be able to share it with you later. So, Anna, if you'd like to introduce Megan. Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Blonder. I'm a member of the Foreign Exchange Sales Team at State Street uh, Megan and I are both based in Boston. So thank you all for joining today. Uh, and thank you to CFA Minnesota for having us. Um, so our speaker today is Megan Sazonis. Uh, Meg leads the portfolio management research team at State Street Associates. So she and her team collaborate with academic partners from Harvard, MIT, and Boston College to develop new research on asset allocation, risk management, and investment strategy. Meg has co-authored various journal articles and works closely with institutional investors to develop customized solutions based on this research. Today, uh, Meg will be presenting on relevance-based prediction. This is a culmination of over two years of research. The approach reinterprets statistical regression in terms of, in terms of learning from experiences as, is as opposed to focusing on variables. The idea is then extended to focus on predicting the most relevant subset of past experiences. This approach offers more transparency and flexibility into making predictions uh, compared to traditional module models offering um, a compelling alternative to both linear regression and machine learning. There will be some time at the end of the presentation to ask any questions. And thank you again for everyone for joining and please take it away, Meg. Awesome, thank you, Hannah, for the introduction. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yep, we can yep. see it. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, so thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for inviting me to present today. So as Hannah uh, nicely introduced, this is uh, a topic that actually encompasses several years of uh, work with my co-authors, uh, Dave Turkington, who's the head of State Street Associates, as well as Mark Kritzman, who's one of uh, the academic partners that we work with at State Street Associates. Um, this is actually a bit of almost a, a COVID uh, project for us, passion project. So we actually wrote a book um, that was published last year. We have a whole series of papers um, that describe this research. So if anyone's interested in learning more um, after the presentation today, we have a lot of materials that we can uh, share with you. And I should also mention, this is also research and a framework that continues to evolve. And so this is an area that we're still working on and expanding and, and thinking more about. So the basic idea is this is, um, this is called relevance-based prediction. And the idea is that it is a new approach to prediction that we think serves as a pretty compelling uh, alternative to both a linear regression and machine learning. Um, and as we'll talk more about, um, uh, and as I'll show, um, our approach can help uh, address complexities that are beyond the capacity of linear uh, regression analysis, um, but in a way that is more uh, transparent and less arbitrary um, than machine learning techniques. And this idea of not being arbitrary is very important to us. Uh, it's important to us that we have a strong theoretical foundation to our approach. And as I'll discuss um, in a few more minutes, um, there's two particular kind of innovations that we rely upon here in our technique. Uh, one is information theory, um, which was developed by Claude Shannon in the, the mid 1950s. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, and the second uh, key uh, foundation uh, found, uh, innovation here is a measure of multivariate distance that was uh, 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 described or, excuse me, introduced by a, a, a statistician uh, named Prasanta Mahalanobis uh, in the early 1900s. So as we develop this um, approach, as I mentioned, uh, having a strong theoretical uh, core was really important to us. And, 
There are actually uh, three uh, principles of a good uh, prediction system that we identified and that we uh, kind of followed as we developed our technique. So one principle that we think is very important um, in a prediction system is that it's transparent. Um, this helps facilitate intuition and in turn that in can inspire confidence in the prediction and the outputs of your, of your prediction system. Um, the second key uh, principle uh, for us is that the uh, prediction system is adaptive. And what we mean by this is that it's flexible and that it essentially responds to the circumstances that you're looking to predict. Um, and then the third key uh, principle for us is that uh, the uh, prediction system is non-arbitrary. And by that we mean it's theoretically justified and it's mathematically unified. Um, so these are three principles that, again, we identified as uh, being very important to us. Um, of course, other people may have other views as to what's important to them, but I'll refer to these as we describe relevance-based uh, relevance prediction, and in particular when we compare um, our approach to existing, uh, existing techniques. So with that, um, I think it helps to contextualize, before we go into relevance-based prediction, I think it's helpful to contextualize by taking a look at other common uh, data-driven approaches to prediction. And probably the most conventional or natural place to start is linear regression, which you know, has been a staple of, of data-driven analysis for, for more than a century. Um, I imagine most of us are familiar with linear regression and how it works. So I won't really belabor the explanation here. Um, but the key point I want to make is that uh, linear regression, it's theoretically elegant and it's simple, which are, are great advantages of the approach. Um, but the key drawback or a key drawback of the approach is that it is in fact linear. Um, so it can't handle complexities such as what you would see here, where, for example, there's asymmetry in the relationship between your predictor variables and your Y variable. Or similarly, if there's conditionality in the relationship, if there's presence of regimes in the data. So when uh, linear regression was invented, it was really meant to help model very simple systems that followed very simple rules. So it was designed at a time where people were thinking about modeling, for example, the, the movement of planets uh, around the solar system. Um, and so um, today, and in particular in finance, you know, we model very complex systems that don't follow simple rules, and there's just complexities that are beyond the capacity of linear regression. So that's why um, a lot of researchers and um, a lot of people have turned to machine learning models um, in order to address and, and model these complex uh, relationships. And for our purposes, I think it's useful to, to categorize uh, machine learning algorithms into two uh, key groups. Um, the first is what we refer to as model-based algorithms. And um, we can think of these as essentially uh, extensions uh, or enhancements to linear regression. So um, examples of these types of models include things like um, lasso regression, uh, tree-based algorithms, uh, neural networks, if you want to get very sophisticated. Uh, so that's one class of, of algorithms. The second is what we refer to as model-free algorithms. And um, as I'll describe in a few minutes, this these actually serve as a bridge uh, to relevance-based prediction, and I'll explain why that is. Um, but examples of these types of models are things like near neighbors, uh, kernel regression, if, you, if you're familiar with those techniques. Um, while we're on this slide, there's two, two of the models I just mentioned I wanted to, to flag in particular, uh, one being lasso regression and the other being kernel regression. And that's because these uh, pretty directly relate to two aspects of relevance-based prediction, which are one, selecting uh, the most important variables uh, for your prediction, and that's what LASSO addresses. And the second is around choosing observations, uh, which is something that kernel regression addresses. And again, as I'll describe soon, um, relevance-based prediction allows you to do those two things as well, to, to select the variables that matter most and to select the most appropriate set of observations to form your prediction. But it does it in a more flexible and a theoretically justified way than these mach machine learning-based techniques. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more. So just to dig a little bit further into these two classes. So again, starting with the machine-based, or excuse me, model-based algorithms. Um, again, these are essentially enhancements or extensions to, to linear regression. 
Um, and the way that they work is just through an iterative process. So the idea is you specify a decision rule, um, you calibrate the rule, you test the rule, and you keep recalibrating and testing until you're happy and satisfied with the, the results of the model. So it's a bit of this iterative, almost, I don't know, trial and error type process. And so uh, the advantage of these types of uh, algorithms is that they are very powerful and they're very flexible in the sense that they can model very complex relationships. So of course that's, that's very useful. Um, the disadvantage though is that they're inflexible in the sense that they don't adapt to new circumstances. So once the model is calibrated, the model is calibrated, it doesn't change. So it's like having this giant rule book, this giant book of decisions for how the way the world works, and that never changes. So it's not adapting or, or it, uh, to the, the circumstances that you're trying to predict. So it's, it's limited in its flexibility in that respect. Um, now, in terms of model-free algorithms, they, um, they work a little bit differently. And so rather than an iterative process to form a prediction, what these models do or what these algorithms do is they form their predictions as weighted averages of past outcomes. So you have something you're interested in predicting, those are your outcomes, and literally the prediction is a weighted average of, of past outcomes for what it is that you're looking to predict. So um, the advantage of these types of algorithms is that they're more flexible than the model-based algorithms, and that's because they actually, the weights that they use adapt to what it is that you're looking to predict, the, to the circumstances of your prediction. Um, and uh, so in that sense, they're more flexible. And they actually serve as a bridge to relevance-based prediction because this is actually how we also form a prediction with relevance with our relevance-based uh, approach. And again, I'll show more about that in a second. Um, but the, the distinction here is that with our approach, with relevance-based weights, they're less arbitrary than the weights that are being used in these existing approaches. So in terms of our approach, um, this brings us to relevance-based prediction. So this is our little icon for relevance-based prediction, which probably seems a little bit odd, um, but it actually pays tribute uh, to two of the, I guess, theoretical foundations and um, uh, innovations that underlie our, our approach. So the first is information theory, which explains the, the phone in our icon. And so um, information theory was invented by Claude Shannon, uh, back in the mid-1950s while he was working at Bell Labs, um, which was a, a prestigious research division uh, within Bell a Telephone Company. So that's why we have the little phone there. And then the skull uh, represents the Mahalanobis distance, which was, it's a measure of multivariate distance that was developed as part of a, an archeological study of, of human skulls. So kind of fun there, our little icon, but just to talk a little bit more about um, these innovations. So the first again is uh, information theory. So this was uh, invented by Claude Shannon in the 1950s. Um, Claude Shannon is actually arguably one of the, the greatest geniuses in, in modern history. He, he actually invented digitization when he was a student at MIT. So in many ways we owe our, our digital age to him. Um, and so while he was at Bell Labs, as I mentioned earlier, um, he inf uh, invented information theory and really the, the core of information theory uh, states that information is inversely related to probability. Um, so what that means is that unusual uh, events uh, contain more information than common events. Um, and with our approach, this is important because this is going to be central in terms of how we define and determine the relevance of historical observations. So that's information theory. Um, the second key innovation uh, is the Mahalanobis distance, which was um, invented by Prasanta Mahalanobis. He was an esteemed uh, Indian statistician from the early 1900s. And the history here is that he invented this measure of multivariate distance as part of a study of uh, human skulls. And the idea was it was a measure that helped to classify a skull by comparing its attributes. So features like measurements of the, the length of the skull or the size of the nose to the average attributes of a particular group of people, right? So it's taking a skull looking at a collection of its measurements and comparing that 
uh, to the typical features or measurements of different groups of people. And his key insight um, in developing this measure was that when you're measuring the distance between two data points that are described by a collection of attributes, right, in his initial incarnation, it was two skulls described by their set of uh, measurements, that it's important to account for the one, the, the typical variation of those individual features or attributes. Um, and secondly, it's important to account for the typical co-occurrence among those attributes. So kind of in mathematical terms, what, what he recognized and, and what is encapsulated in the Mahalo Novus distance is that it's important to account for the variances and the correlations uh, among variables. And we'll take a look at the, the formula for that uh, shortly. So the way that this applies in, in our technique is that we're going to use the Mahalanobis distance to really precisely and statistically measure the relevance of historical observations. So those are the, the two, uh, I guess, key theoretical foundations of our approach. Um, uh, just to round out this, uh, our approach conceptually before we take a look at the math, um, there's three key tenets that underlie our approach. So the first is relevance. Um, and in a nutshell, this is the importance of an observation to a prediction. It consists of two components, informativeness and similarity. And we measure those components as Mahalanobis distances. And again, we'll take a look at the math in a few minutes. The second uh, key tenant of our approach is fit. And this is really cool. This is about measuring the reliability of an individual prediction. So you can actually think of fit as similar to a model's R squared. But whereas R squared is actually a summary of a model's average reliability across a lot of predictions, fit is specific to an individual prediction. Um, and not only that, but you can determine fit in advance of uh, forming a prediction, which means you can use it to decide how much confidence you should have in a prediction before you even make it, basically. And then our third tenant is uh, tenant is uh, codependence, uh, which relates to my earlier comments about uh, variable selection and observation selection. And the idea here is that uh, when we select variables, the variables we select is going to depend on the observations we choose. And uh, similarly, the observations we choose are going to depend on the variables we're using to determine relevance. And so this codependence suggests that we actually want to make these two decisions about what variables do we want to use and what observations do we want to select. We want to make those two decisions jointly or simultaneously, not, not independently of one another. Um, and what's powerful is that fit is going to allow us to do that. So that's relevance at a, a more conceptual level. Um, what we can do now is, is go into more of the, the mathematical uh, details. So um, this first slide is just starting by taking a, a step back and saying, well, how do we form a prediction with our relevance-based approach? And like uh, model-free algorithms, as, I, as we talked about earlier, um, we form our prediction as a weighted average of past outcomes for Y. So again, we have something we want to predict. Let's say it's the return of the stock market. And we're, our prediction for today is going to be based on a weighted average of what happened to the stock market historically. Um, and so that's exactly what that, that first formula shows. So it's showing that our prediction Y hat is a function of weights and past outcomes for our y variable. Now, the, the way that we've written it here, it's very general, right? So those weights could be determined theoretically, or you know, you could choose whatever weights you want. Um, but with relevance-based prediction, um, we, we have a very precise way that we, um, that we determine those weights, and that it's as a function of an observation's relevance. And recall that relevance is the importance of an observation to, prediction, uh, to a prediction. Uh, and so that's just what that bottom formula is showing, that our weights are a function of relevance. So that being said, how do we determine relevance? So relevance is determined by our x variables, right? So we can think of our y variable, its job is to tell us what happened historically. 
And then the job of our X variables is going to be to tell us how we want to weight our historical observations when we, when we form our, our prediction of what we think will happen going forward. So this first equation um, shows that an observation is relevant. So right, we have all these historical observations. And the relevance of each observation is going to consist of two things, um, its informativeness and its similarity. So that's what that first formula shows. And then the next two equations uh, further define what those two components are. Again, informativeness and similarity. So I'll actually start with the bottom equation, which shows how we measure uh, informativeness. And I should also mention that these are both Mahalanobis distances now. So we talked about the Mahalanobis distance. So focusing first on that final equation, the informativeness. So what this is showing is that an observation's informativeness is measured as its Mahalanobis distance from average. So just walking through this a bit, remember the, the uh, Mahalanobis distance is based on the X variables, right? So that could be growth, inflation, interest rates, whatever it is that we're interested in using to predict our, our outcomes. And so what we're doing is for each historical observation in our sample, we're taking a vector of values for its X variables, and that in the formula is what we're denoting as xi. And we measure uh, its distance from the average value of those x variables across all the observations. And that's shown with the, the x bar. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Mahalanobis distance accounts for the variables, uh, typical variances and correlations. And so that's where that omega inverse comes in. So that's actually the inverse of the variables covariance matrix. Um, and then finally, that final term, uh, the transpose of the first just collapses everything to a single number. So conceptually, you can actually think of, I think a nice way to think about the Mahalanobis distance is it's almost like a multivariate z-score, right? So if you had a single x variable, your z-score would be today's value minus its average value divided by its standard deviation. And the Mahalanobis distance is effectively doing the same thing, but it's looking at a whole vector of, of, of variables values um, and, and measuring how distant they are from, from average, accounting for how the, they typically correlate with each other and their, their typical variances. So that's, that's informativeness. Um, similarity, if you look up one equation, uh, is similar. So it's based on an observation's uh, Mahalanobis distance to the current circumstances. Um, which we show as xt. So now our x bar is replaced with xt. Um, and here we actually take the negative of the Mahalanobis distance, because if we think of distance as a measure of dissimilarity, our measure of similarity is going to be its negative. So uh, what we do again is for each observation, we calculate these two Mahalanobis distances, its informativeness, its similarity to what it is that we're predicting, or the circumstances that we're predicting, and then the sum of those two things uh, is the relevance of uh, each historical observation. Um, so what this means uh, intuitively is that your most relevant observations are going to be those that are similar to today. So we want to rely on observations that look similar to the circumstances we're predicting, but they're dissimilar from average, and that's informativeness. And again, that relates to this idea that unusual observations uh, contain more information than uh, typical observations. So just to reiterate, um, this definition of relevance is not arbitrary. Um, we don't necessarily have to go through this slide, but suffice it to say, uh, using the Mahalanobis distance is basically justified by the central limit theorem, uh, theorem and information theory. So that's one reason this definition of relevance is not arbitrary. And then another reason it's not arbitrary is because um, relevance has a really interesting and nice mathematical equivalence to linear regression. So it ends up that when we form our prediction as a relevance weighted average of all past outcomes for y, so if we use our full historical sample of observations to form our prediction, that that prediction uh, is identical to the prediction from a linear regression. So literally, it's the same as if we took that historical data, we ran a regression, we estimated the betas of our x variables, and then we applied those betas to today's set of x variables and took their sum to form our prediction. That's literally identical to the uh, relevance-based approach based on that same full set of observations. 
So this equivalence is nice for, for two uh, key reasons. So one, again, it means relevance is not arbitrary. So it inherits the, the theoretical merits of, uh, of linear regression. Um, but it also, um, what may not be obvious just from this equation, but it also reveals a really interesting assumption of linear regression, uh, which is that what happened following relevant periods in the past will recur, which makes sense, but also that what happened during non-relevant periods in the past will recur, but in the opposite direction. So um, I guess maybe to take a step back, relevance for about half the observations is going to be negative. So what this means is that when you use a full set of your historical data to form your prediction, linear regression is actually placing as much emphasis on non-relevant observations as it does on relevant observations, but it flips the sign of their effect. So it's effectively predicting the opposite will occur uh, following the non-relevant uh, episodes. And this really is the, the essence of linearity. That's why linear regression is linear, right? Because it's this assumption that opposite X's or opposite circumstances should result in opposite Y's. Um, but as I think many of us are, are aware that, that that is not necessarily the way that, that, the, that the, the world works, it's not always gonna be linear. So this basically raises the question of, you know, does this make sense, right? So does it make sense to use, to rely on non-relevant observations as much as we rely on relevant observations. So, you know, an intuitive example would be if you're looking to predict, for example, the outcome of, uh, of a recession, you know, would you actually think it makes sense to look at, you know, past periods of robust growth and just assume the opposite of what happened followed those periods will happen today's recession? Or would it make more sense? Would you feel more comfortable just looking at what happened following past uh, recessions instead? So this is a bit of an empirical question uh, in terms of whether it makes sense to focus on a subset of relevant observations. But in a lot of the work that we've done, we found that it, it does improve the reliability of the predictions if you effectively censor your sample to exclude your non-relevant observations and you form your prediction instead from a subset of the uh, of the most relevant observations. So we refer to, refer to this as partial sample regression. And again, the idea here is uh, you determine the relevance of all the observations in your historical sample, and then you censor the non-relevant ones before you form your prediction as a, a relevance-weighted average of, of past outcomes. And really the benefit here is that it's going to allow you or allows this method to address asymmetries and nonlinearities in the data. So that's how we become more flexible than, than linear regression. So that, that's the math behind relevance and, and how we form our predictions. Um, so to touch on the other two tenets, again, which are fit and codependence. So let's imagine now that we have two predictions. We have one that's based on our full sample of observations, which is like our linear regression um, prediction. We have another uh, prediction that's uh, based on a subset of the most relevant observations. Uh, those two predictions are different. Um, so which one should we have more confidence in, right? And so the traditional way that people would answer this question is they would say, okay, well, I'll estimate a whole bunch of predictions for these two different models, uh, and I'll select whichever model was most reliable on average using a statistic like the R squared. Um, but with relevance-based prediction, we can actually do better than that because we can measure the reliability of an individual prediction without actually knowledge of its average efficacy across other predictions. And so we refer to this as FIT, uh, which again is the second key tenant of our approach. And conceptually, you can think of FIT as capturing and summarizing the strength of the patterns in the data that form our prediction. Um, mathematically, there's um, a few different equivalent ways to write FIT. I think the second equation is uh, on this slide is probably the simplest one to interpret. And what this shows is that fit is simply the squared correlation between the relevance weights and the outcomes that form our prediction. So intuitively, fit is capturing the alignment between relevance and outcomes that are forming the prediction. So if there's strong alignment, 
meaning your similarly relevant observations tend to have similar outcomes, then we should have more confidence in a prediction because it's as if all of our relevant observations agree. Um, conversely, if there was weak alignment uh, among the, the underlying data, meaning your relevance and your outcomes are all over the place, then you should have less confidence in that prediction. It suggests that it, prediction in that sense is perhaps a more futile, futile attempt. So I just want to really emphasize here that um, fit is specific to an, a single prediction. So, you know, you could use the same data, you could use the same model to form predictions for two different circumstances. Uh, and in one case, we could have a very high fit, which would indicate there's very strong patterns and essentially historical precedence for the circumstances we're predicting. But in the other case, we could have a low fit, which just means there's weak patterns and, and prediction isn't going to be potentially as effective. Uh, and fit allows us to know this in advance and can help us inform perhaps how confident we should be in our predictions. So um, that's fit. And just to mention, there's another um, important mathematical equivalence here, which is that in the case of a full sample regression, um, the weighted average fit across all individual predictions is equal to that model's R squared. So again, this is important because it means fit's not arbitrary. Um, and it also, I think, just underscores this point that R squared is truly a summary statistic, right? So it's a, a model is an average of some good predictions and some bad ones, and that we gain a lot of transparency by quantifying the reliability of, of individual predictions. So, you know, you could have two models where one uh, does better on average than the other, but for particular prediction task, you may choose the model with the lower R squared because it actually has a higher fit for that particular set of circumstances. Um, and I guess another interesting point is that, you know, fit is based, recall, fit is based on basically patterns between relevance and outcome. So it actually doesn't even know anything about the prediction itself, which means you can estimate fit before you even form a prediction. Uh, and again, that's another advantage of the approach. Um, and in particular, that helps with this third tenant, uh, which is codependence. And um, recall that, you know, one key, well, we have two key decisions that we need to make when we use relevance-based prediction. The one key decision is how much do we want to censor our sample when we form the prediction, right? So in one case, I could use all of the historical observations in my sample, which is similar to or, or identical to a linear regression or I could focus on a very narrow subset of the most relevant observations. Um, and there's actually a, a trade-off here because as we narrow our focus into a, a subset of uh, fewer and fewer relevant observations, there could be a benefit in the sense that the subsample fit between relevance and outcomes improves compared to the full sample of observations. So those relevant observations are more useful, but at the same time, you could be introducing or you are introducing noise because you're using fewer observations. So how do you kind of calibrate that decision? And fortunately, we can actually use fit to do that. Um, and that's because fit uh, recognizes and explicitly accounts for the potential benefit and costs of reducing the, the subset of observations. So the formula that you see here um, is another just equivalent way of writing fit. Um, but the way we have it uh, written here shows that fit imposes, in, imposes a, a noise penalty for reducing the number of observations. Um, and it also, uh, while also capturing the potential improvement and alignment in, in that subsample of, of observations. So the idea here is that for a particular prediction, you know, we can test various thresholds for uh, censoring our sample, and then we can choose whichever, um, whichever uh, threshold maximizes fit for that circumstance. Um, the second key uh, decision that we need to make is what variables we want to use to determine relevance. Um, again, there's a bit of a trade-off here if we use a lot of variables that potentially provides a richer sense of relevance. Um, but the, the drawback is that if the variables don't actually uh, relate to outcomes, they could introduce noise. And so um, going back to the, the third tenant of codependence, 
um, this decision uh, of in terms of what variables we want to do um, depends on the observations we select. So, you know, in order to select observations, we need variables to determine their relevance. And in order to uh, select variables, we need observations to determine their usefulness. And so whereas lasso and kernel regression make those decisions independently, we argue that they should be determined jointly. Um, and that's what we refer to as a CKT regression. So the idea here is that for a given prediction, uh, you test or we test different combinations of relevance thresholds uh, for selecting our uh, observations, as well as different variable groups uh, for measuring relevance. And then we select the combination that maximizes fit. And just really to, to kind of reiterate here, that optimal decision varies by each prediction. So it's not like there's some universal set of variables that we always say is the, the set we want to use and the, the threshold we want to use in terms of selecting observations. But every time we have a new prediction, we're going to determine the combination that makes most sense for that particular circumstance. So that's, that's the math um, behind relevance. Um, I think now what we'll do is we'll, we'll go into this illustration, which will hopefully help um, illustrate how this approach works and, and how it can actually behave quite intuitively. Um, this is an illustration that is based on simulation. So we simulated a, a regime model. Um, you know, we use simulation here because it basically allows us to contrive a, a data set that has known properties to see if CKT regression behaves in, a, in an intuitive way. So at a really high level, what we're going to do is we simulate a, a two state regime model uh, where the properties of the X variables and the relationship to Y are conditional on the regime. And then what we'll do is we'll apply CKT regression to form out a sample predictions and see, see how those behave. So we can walk through the assumptions a little bit more. So in terms of our regimes, uh, we're going to assume that at any point in time, we're in one of two regimes. Both regimes are somewhat persistent, um, but regime one is going to be more persistent than, the, than regime two. And that's what that first table shows. It's a, a transition matrix, and it shows that if we're in regime one, 80% of the time we stay in regime one, uh, and 20% of the time we would transition into two. Uh, whereas if we're in regime two, 40% of the time we stay in the same regime and 60% of the time we would go back to regime one. So those are our regimes and how they evolve. Um, in terms of the X variables, we're gonna assume that we have four X variables, A, B, C, and D. And we assume that A and B are a group. So they're 50% correlated uh, with each other, but uncorrelated with C and D, and then C and D are also a group. So same properties amongst themselves and versus the other two variables. So that's what we're showing in, in the uh, second table. So now how do we, what are our assumptions around the, the conditional probabilities or excuse me, properties of these variables? So that's what we show in the top table. So we're gonna assume that when we're in regime one, which is the, the top row in that table, that A and B are, are tightly distributed around a positive mean, and they determine Y. Um, meanwhile, C and D just contribute noise. And then in regime two, it's the reverse. Uh, so C and D are tightly distributed. They impact Y, but A and B don't really matter. So just to summarize, what we're doing here is we're modeling uh, two regimes where in regime one, it's more persistent, and A and B matter. And then in regime two, it's less persistent and uh, C and D matter. And so what we do is we simulate uh, 500 observations based on these assumptions. We're going to use that as our training sample. So we can think of that as our historical data. 50 observations uh, we simulate as our testing sample. And then we apply CKT regression to form predictions for those 50 out of sample observations. And when we run CKT regression, we allow it to select for each prediction the set of variables and the subset of observations that maximize the fit for that prediction. So we let it consider three sets of variables that can either choose A and B, C and D, or all four. And then we allow it to select uh, for uh, selecting observations 
it tests different uh, relevance percentile thresholds ranging from zero to 90% uh, in 10% increments. So there's 10 different thresholds for either selecting the full sample of uh, training observations or up to only 10% of the most relevant. And then what we do is we compare this to the output of just a linear regression. So here's how the, the results look. I guess it's kind of a crowded slide, but I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, so the first thing is that the predictions themselves, so the CKT predictions, are more correlated with actual outcomes than the linear regression predictions, which is great. So they're 89% correlated versus 54% correlated based on the linear regression. So that's encouraging. The predictions themselves are better. Um, second uh, interesting observation is that the errors or the absolute errors in the CKT predictions are negatively correlated with their fits. Um, and so this is encouraging because what that means is that the tighter, the stronger the fit, the smaller the errors of that prediction. And that's good because again, we're thinking of fit as telling us how much confidence we should have in a prediction. And then the third thing is that we see some really intuitive behavior with how CKT regression selects variables and observations. And that's what some of the, the charts at the bottom show. So if you look at that top bar chart, so each bar here represents a, a, an out of sample prediction. So there's 50. The color of the bar indicates the variable combo that was optimal or that CKT chose to form that prediction. And then the height of the bar uh, indicates the fraction of the observations that it selected again to form its prediction. And so there's a couple of intuitive things here. So one, you'll see that many of the predictions uh, or a lot of the predictions more often rely on variables A and B, which are the blue bars versus C and D, which are the black bars. And recall that A and B were important in the more persistent of the two regimes. That makes sense. We should expect to see that the, the model wants to rely on those more often. Um, you'll also see that when it selects A and B, again, the blue bars, it tends to use a greater fraction of the observations than when it uses C and D. And again, that makes sense because uh, that regime is more persistent and therefore it occurs more often in our sample. So it makes sense that you'd want to use more observations. More observations are relevant. And then finally, uh, you'll notice that when the model selects all four variables, which are the gray bars, which isn't that often, the fit is actually quite low for those predictions. And that's what you see uh, the bars at the bottom, the orange bars are fit. And basically what that means is that when the regime is ambiguous, uh, the CKT regression becomes much more like a full sample linear regression and ends up just kind of using all the variables and, and all the observations. So again, I, I think this just shows some nice um, intuitive behavior in terms of how the algorithm, you know, selects variables and observations. And again, just really emphasizing the point that, you know, these decisions aren't universal, um, but rather um, they vary with, with the, the prediction task. So with that, I will go ahead and just wrap up with um, a, a brief summary of, of how relevance-based prediction compares to uh, the existing approaches, namely uh, linear regression and machine learning. And I, I guess I've been touching on this throughout, but just to, to, to conclude. Um, and here, this is in particular from the perspective of the, the principles I, I set forth earlier. So linear regression, key strength, theoretically elegant, uh, so it's not arbitrary. Um, but the weakness there is it can't effectively model uh, complex relationships. Uh, so in that respect, it's not adaptable. And it also has limited transparency uh, in the sense that it's opaque in terms of the importance of your observations and it can't tell you about the reliability of individual predictions, just the reliability of the model overall. Um, moving on to machine learning, um, key strength here, you can model very complex relationships, which is certainly valuable, but the weakness is that it actually scores pretty poorly along all three of our, our principles that are important to us. So, Machine learning models are notoriously opaque. Um, the, the most powerful models don't adapt to the circumstances. They're flexible when they come up with all these potential scenarios and decision rules, but they're not flexible after that. They don't adapt. 
um, and they're also not theoretically uh, justified. Uh, and then when we get to relevance-based prediction, <laughs> surprise, surprise, it, it satisfies our, our three principles. So it helps improve transparency, right? We can see the importance of observations, which can help build a lot of intuition. Um, and uh, we can measure the reliability of individual predictions. It's adaptable, right? It's going to select observations and variables based on the circumstances that you're looking to predict. And it is non-arbitrary um, in the sense that it's, you know, justified by several uh, theories and uh, mathematically unified with, with linear regression. So kind of a lot, but I'll, I'll pause there and see if anyone has any questions. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Meg. If anyone has any questions um, in the audience, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. If not, I have collected a couple that people have sent in. All right, I will go ahead and ask the first one that got sent in. Um, how do you think the method of relevance-based prediction will evolve? What what are ways to make it more accurate or applicable to more scenarios? Yeah, so um, some of the work that we're doing is just on, um, I guess there's several ways that we're thinking of kind of expanding this conceptually. Um, I think it's really nice and clean the way everything works now. Some of the, the areas that we're, we're thinking about are um, if we can evolve how we uh, optimally select variables and um, excuse me variables and observations if we can evolve that to become a little bit more sophisticated to account for even more complex relationships um, so we have some very like simple toy examples for example with that v that i showed earlier where if you have a relationship where there's just this like perfect asymmetry we can look at how well you know our our approach does at uh, predicting that sort of relationship. You can also imagine like a hockey stick right, type relationship. And so um, I guess part of one area that we're, we're considering is are there ways to refine um, either the fit metric or the way through which we iterate through we forming our predictions to even improve uh, how we can model uh, complexities in the data. So that, that's one area that we're thinking about conceptually. We also are doing a lot of work on the application side. So this presentation here is really more of, of course, the conceptual and, and mathematical explanation of the approach. But we have applied this to actual um, actual real world uh, examples. So our first paper, actually, which is several years ago where we first introduced this approach, uh, use this to um, uh, to uh, to predict uh, the returns of equity factors, for example. Um, we've also looked at it to predict asset class returns. Um, and the methodologies evolved a little bit since some of those initial papers. But another area of research that we're working on is just finding some actual really nice, clean, uh, real world applications of where this adds a lot of value as well. So we're working on both kind of the conceptual side of things as well as some of the more um, kind of case study application side of things uh, as well. Great, thank you. And then I think we have one more. Um, in centering your observation set, is there any consideration for reducing the weighting of less relevant observations versus removing them completely? I know you had mentioned that you kind of switch the sign, but mm -hmm. um, could you explain that? Other yeah, so the way it actually works is, so we censor the observations, so we identify the subset of observations that we want to remove from the sample. Um, but basically what we're doing, right, if you recall the way that our, um, the, the uh, out, excuse me, the way that the um, prediction is formed, right, it's, it's a weighted average of relevance weights times outcomes. And um, the relevance weights of the non-relevant observations actually don't exactly equal zero, even after we quote unquote censor them from our sample. So mathematically, they're actually still contributing a little bit to the prediction. They're just very close to having a minimal uh, impact. Um, so uh, that that's kind of mathematically how it works. And again, um, I guess maybe just to take a step back, we're not necessarily saying that you always want to remove anything that is non-relevant, that has, for example, a negative weight. 
but rather at certain points in time, it may make sense to use even non-relevant observations um, depending on, on kind of the characteristics of the data. So if there really is a linear relationship in, in, in the uh, relationship between uh, your, your circumstances and your outcomes, then you actually want to use all the observations because more observations helps, um, I guess, give you more um, kind of confidence in the prediction. You have more underlying data points. But in other situations, you might, might want to be very uh, narrow as well. So it's not like you always want to throw out all the uh, non-relevant observations. It's going to vary. Um, and then I guess just mathematically, even when we do, they do have like a little, a little marginal impact on the, the prediction, just the way the math works out. Great, thank you. I'll go back to the audience, see if anyone has uh, any questions they'd like to ask. Um, and if not, I think we will wrap it up. Um, thank you again to the CFA Minnesota and to all of you. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, please reach out to me or Meg and we'd be happy to answer. Um, CFA Minnesota will be sharing the recording, so please check your email and keep your eye out for future events. Um, thank you and have a great day, everyone.